Well, how y'all doing? Welcome. Good morning to everybody. I really appreciate uh, everyone being here. I'm, I know I think I met at least 95% of you. There were some tricklers that came in. I'm Zach Klein. I'm the Columbus City Attorney. Uh, and certainly welcome everyone to this really important discussion that uh, the Ohio State University and Dean Martin has put together. Uh, certainly appreciate your work in Community Properties of Ohio. Thank you so much for hosting us. Uh, a couple other thanks that I want to start off with is um, the Prevention Action Alliance Ohio College Initiative and the Ohio State University Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery. Really appreciate your participation. Um, so just a little bit of background of what brought us here today and my specific involvement. Um, the mayor uh, commission, then commission president John O'Grady uh, and myself asked Adam H back in the late spring, early summer of 2017 to put together uh, an opioid action plan. I, I don't think I need to go into details of the proliferation of heroin and opioids in our community and the dangers they cause, but certainly uh, we did need to go into detail of putting together a plan of how we can do our part to solve it. Uh, so Adam H. Uh, went around and talked to a lot of community stakeholders and developed what we now have as the opioid action plan. And I see that in front of you, you have the actual action plan for uh, reading during the break. Um, but essentially, it's a three-year plan that has four buckets. And the first bucket uh, is prevention education. Uh, the second is rehabilitation, uh, an opportunity for recovery. The third is law enforcement, and the fourth is health care. Uh, and under each of those is a outline, an annual outline, 2017, 2018, 2019, and so on, of action items that we believe in conjunction with the city and the county uh, can make a difference in tackling opioids in our community. Uh, the city and the county came together, uh, and I decided to, um, because of my belief and passion in this area, to be the point person uh, in running the implementation of the Opioid Action Plan. We brought on Amy O'Grady. Uh, Amy has uh, been a rock star in this issue, came from the Attorney General's office, uh, is well-respected, well-versed, uh, and we're very excited about the progress that we made thus far. And one of the action items in the, the checklist that need to be done is bringing together college and universities, uh, which we're doing today to talk about uh, how opioids are affecting the students and their families. And I, I liken this as an analogy uh, to um, what we did maybe 10 days ago at this point, I'm losing track of time, but we had a corporate advisory council. We brought together the corporate advisory council. We had uh, folks from the Columbus Partnership, the African American Chamber of Commerce, the Latino Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, we had the Columbus Chamber of Commerce, 70 or 80 businesses that came together. Uh, the purpose was really twofold. The first is how does opioids and addiction and drug addiction generally affect their workplace? Uh, affect their workers, their productivity, and then their families. Well, this is a very similar conversation here. How are opioids and drug addiction generally affecting students and their families? Because in the workplace, it, it drives work performance and productivity, and in the academic space, it, it has a direct impact on academic performance. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the person who is the user. It could be the roommate. It could be the family member. And it all has a direct impact on uh, that person's academic performance, which, you know, is from a workforce development standpoint for the city, want to have great workers, want to have a great workforce, want to train the next generation to provide for our economy. Uh, and at the same time, make sure we have uh, a clean environment, a, a safe environment for those who are addicted to be able to pull themselves out of recovery or pull themselves into recovery uh, so that they are on a path for success for them and their families. So that's what brings us here today, uh, and I'm excited about this opportunity and certainly am grateful for everyone's participation because we have to be able to come together uh, in the way that we do things in the city of Columbus in a collaborative effort. There is not one entity in this room or one governmental entity or private business entity that's going to make a direct impact and solve this problem. It is too complex. It is historical in nature. This isn't the first time drug addiction uh, has affected communities in the 80s. It was crack cocaine, affected primarily communities of color, color uh, methamphetamine, uh, com affected primarily rural communities. It's just now that it's a suburban problem, it's now on our radar screens. So what we can do is use the past as our guide to create a model to uh, address drug addiction for the future moving, moving forward, knowing that uh, this isn't the first time that addiction has ever plagued a community, uh, but it is one that has grown in exponential rate where people are dying or we're administering Narcan seven to eight times a day uh, through Columbus uh, Public Health, I'm sorry, through Columbus um, 
uh, division of fire as well as our Columbus division of police. This is a real problem in our community and it's up to us as the gatekeepers of this time in this moment uh, to do our part. So I'd like to bring up uh, Dean Martin. Uh, thank you for joining me today and thank you for being part of the convening here. Thank you, Zach. Um, I would imagine five years ago, none of us would be thinking this would be in this room and it would be such a sort of seminal moment for higher ed in Franklin County to come together on this important issue. Um, and so this is a tsunami that has been going on for a couple decades. It was way out there at sea and by the time it hit shore, it was too late. And so all of us are in this odd position of playing catch up. Uh, one thing I can say, at least on our own campus, the Collegiate Recovery uh, uh, Center at Ohio State has always been sort of that beacon. Uh, it was started um, with the best interests of the students and the families, and it has been highly successful. Uh, so the Office of Student Life, the Higher Ed Center for Alcohol and Other Drugs at OSU, the College of Social Work, Pharmacy, have all been integral to making this, uh, I think, a very successful uh, and personalized uh, effort. The challenge with the opioid crisis is just as Zach said, it is so complex, it is generational in origin, and there are no quick fixes. There are some answers, but there are not complete answers. And so the opportunity to bring people together so we can learn from each other is, I think, instrumental. And anytime you can beg, borrow, steal a model that's working, do so, that's the trick. And uh, in public health, our mantra is we go forward with evidence-based strategies. And that's what we need. We need to evaluate everything we're doing. We need to understand the impact. Is it sustainable? Because you're never gonna be able to go back to the funders in five years or 10 years unless you can prove that what you're doing has an impact. And so, you know, a very popular show this past year has been This Is Us. I'll tell you what, there's nothing quite like the opioid crisis to point out this is us. Everybody's affected, and it's tearing apart the fabric of society, and it needs multiple entry points, and I think this is a critical one. I don't, would also want to underscore, although we're talking about higher ed, I would step back and ask where are students coming from? Where are the handoffs at high school? Where are the handoffs? In Ohio, it is said, I'm not sure how accurate the data is, up to 10% of middle school students are using drugs. So we've got to cover middle school. But if you want to do prevention, you should be thinking from birth to age five in kindergarten readiness. And when they hit first grade, you should be thinking right then, how do you start the conversations? So we're kind of at the high end here. It's an important thing to do. And we have to be there for our students, their friends, and their families. And so I feel very privileged to be here today. And thank you. Yes, we were a little late. It was hard to find East Gay Street in this part of Columbus, but we did get here, so I apologize for that. Thank you. So good morning. My name is Jose, and I've connected with many of you when we were originally inviting you for this meeting. So thanks for inviting the College of Public Health and the Ohio State University. So when the dean mentioned this is us, I want to share with you a quick story about a couple of months ago. Uh, one of our professors reached out to me and said, Jose, I'm working with a student that is working on this culminating project, and it's a really cool project. It has to do with communications and opiates. I think you should take a look at it. He's looking at a model of how do we communicate with, how do um, physicians communicate with patients. So I said, great, I'd love to take a look, look at it. So I called the guy, um, and during our conversation, he finally comes out to me, and he goes, well, you know, I'm in recovery myself. I said, well, you know, are you comfortable telling me a little bit more about it so that I can kind of understand your lens? And then he tells me, well, I have a chronic disease, so I suffer from a lot of pain, and I was addicted for five years to opiates, then I switched to heroin, and now I have been in recovery for five years. And when the dean talks about this is us, um, you know, we have a way of, of separating ourselves from, from um, many of the issues that we work with. But that was like, this is a, a nice young man who's part of our family at the College of Public Health, and he's one of us, and hopefully he'll be one of you. He'll be in academia working to solve this problem. But we need to sometimes look within our own audience 
I know you lived that through the great work that you guys do at the CRC, in which we, we have a family within our own family that is really being affected. So the goal for today's meeting, which is what I'm supposed to be chatting with you about, is really to bring you together, and like the dean said, to share best practices in public health. When I worked with Dr. Roberts at Columbus Public Health, Dr. Roberts was very familiar with bringing people together from academia and the Med Center at the university. We've brought people together for the Ebola, um, when we had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, when we had, what else, Mexica, when Zika. So we have a long history in public health, both in practice and in academia, of helping bring people together to the table so that we're all sharing, like the dean said, if we have a model that works, let's share it with each other and um, we can all benefit from it. So some of you may have a lot going on in your institution. Some of you may not have a lot of activity going on with opiates, but we can certainly learn from each other. So I think that's the goal for the meeting. And how we move forward, we would love to hear from you as to how we want to move forward. There were many um, institutions that were not able to be here today, but thanks to the City of Columbus, we're taping the session so we can get them that information and hopefully invite them for a future forum. So, Amy, thanks. Thanks, Jose, and, and thank you for the opportunity to work or to be here today. Uh, my name is Amy O'Grady. I work for Columbus City Attorney Zach Klein, and as he mentioned, I coordinate the Franklin County Opiate Action Plan. Uh, the, the plan is a three-year plan, uh, and you know, as uh, Zach expressed, um, you know, there are city and county agency efforts uh, to address the opioid epidemic and how explain how we work with communities uh, to address what they're going through. Um, but the plan is flexible and the plan, um, you know, we work um, both inside and outside the plan on a daily basis. Um, but we've got a copy of it for you so you can read through it. Uh, but really, please know that if there are things that you need and things that are happening in your community that you would like us to know about and focus on, we would love to hear from you. Um, we meet on a monthly basis with each of our subcommittees. Um, there's one additional subcommittee that is not outlined in your plan, uh, and that's our Recovery and Community Engagement Subcommittee. Um, there are a number of community groups, uh, neighborhood associations, labor, labor unions, others, uh, faith communities, that we wanted to make sure that we were having outreach to and keeping in contact with. So we wanted to make sure that subcommittee focused on giving those uh, groups a voice and then also taking that input and making sure that we're um, putting our best foot forward to help the community when it comes to their needs uh, because of the drug problem that we're facing. Um, so please, we, uh, we welcome your input uh, when it comes to the plan itself. Uh, I wanted to express a little bit more about the purpose of today. We, you know, having attended college up in Kent State, I can tell you, um, I was talking with Chad, um, you know, Kettler, who you'll hear more from in a little bit. We come from a small village and, you know, up in Northeast Ohio. And when, when I went to Kent, you know, I remember thinking, my gosh, I'm on my own. I have a lot of things that I can make choices and I, you know, can go independent from my mom and dad and go left or go right. And really, it's up to me how things end up. And Ken was a great school. I had a lot of people that I could rely upon, but boy, things have changed. And we really want to hear from you about what you're doing when it comes to those changes that have happened in our environment. And we want to hear from you about what kind of needs that you may have. There are a lot of great things going on at Ohio State that you'll hear about today, but we certainly left wanted to leave room on the, on the, you know, on the agenda so we can hear from you, not just about what you're doing, but about what you need from us when it comes to this plan. Uh, so please, we welcome you. You know, I can tell you that we're applying for grants actively. You know, we're looking for funding sources, you know, so we can make sure that your lives are easier when it comes to work. You know, Nettie Ferguson's here from the Adam H Board. I can tell you it's not an easy job to work in prevention. You have so many things in instances, um, whether it be higher education or other schools, where, you know, you have teachers who say, my gosh, we have so much time in the day where certain pressures are upon us or certain things are on the table that we may not have time to approach one more thing when it comes to prevention. We want to figure out what we can do today to help you because there are many avenues that we can take. So please, let, you know, let's, let's get into it today. Let's figure out from here what we can do to move forward together. Uh, you'll hear from Daisha Darby and Cindy Clowner and Ahmed Hosni and about how many programs are going on in the community. I don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel. 
we have so many good things going on that we can get that access to you for that information to not create yet another group or another meeting, but make sure that you have access to the good things going on to make us all come together and just work towards solutions. So thank you again for being here today. And Daisha, it's your turn. I hope you all can see me over this. I have short people problems. Okay. Hi. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Daisha Darby, and I am the program manager for Ohio College Initiative at Prevention Action Alliance. It's at Prevention Action Alliance. Um, for many of you who don't know what Prevention Action Alliance is, uh, Prevention Action Alliance is a statewide uh, prevention um, agency, nonprofit, that um, they provide many services. Um, their main basis is alcohol and other substance misuse, as well as mental health wellness. And so they are the lead agency around the state that provide many training resources, many different opportunities for people, education, um, different classes, and so forth. Um, they have many different programs, like um, Parents Who Host Lose the Most. Um, that program, uh, it's about uh, teenage drinking education, and many communities around the state have many different resources from parents who host lose the most. Um, the NO program, where they give many different parents and caregivers of middle age, school, um, education, and strategy and empowerment. Um, that is a, a program branched off of Governor Kasich's uh, Start Talking program. Uh, Buzzkill, um, it helps educate uh, college students about students who uh, misuse alcohol and other um, drugs as well. Uh, Smart Bet uh, promotes responsible gambling. Um, they have Ohio Youth-Led Prevention Network. Ohio Youth-Led Prevention Network is a program for um, youth around the country. Every year they host a rally um, downtown Columbus. It is about, I want to say, over 2,000 students every year that comes and they march to the state capitol with different messages with pre about prevention. Also, they have the Statewide Prevention Coalition Associa Association, that's SPECA, and they bring many different coalitions from around the state uh, to meet quarterly and they organize uh, different resources, best practices, and collaborate. Um, also, they have the GAP Network, which focuses on uh, substance misuse, um, and then it's Ohio College Initiative, and that's what I'm here to talk about. And so that's just a, um, a short overview. I went kind of fast, but um, the website, uh, preventionactionalliance.org, will give you a lot of information about the different programs that they offer. Uh, the Ohio College Initiative, um, it's a program that has been in existence since 2000, I'm sorry, 1996. And so 1996, the goal of OCI was to reduce high-risk drinking on college campuses. As many of us know that that has been the culture for many campuses around uh, the country, around the world. And so uh, as of lately, the mission has moved more towards overall campus wellness and to collaborate imp and implement strategies that promote, you know, healthier campus communities but our focus still is on that substance misuse component. Um, it's, um, Ohio College Initiative supports many campuses with their efforts to build coalitions with their communities and to address alcohol misuse. Um, it is the first statewide college collaborative in the country. So this uh, collaborative is a collaborative. Right now we have 54 colleges that are a part of Ohio College Initiative. And those, um, it started off with 19 institutions, but now we have grown. And we host many different, um, I'll get into that in a second, we host many different things to help those many different colleges around the state. And it's grant funded through Ohio Moss. Um, the program focuses on five primary strategies, um, restricting the marketing of promotion of alcohol, uh, improving social, recreational, and academic uh, options and performance, limiting substance availability. So we try to help many different colleges, campuses, college campuses um, focus on different em environmental strategies that can be beneficial to those campus communities, um, increasing uh, consistent enforcement of laws and policies, creating a healthy promoting uh, health promoting environment and in addition to all of these we also provide training resources support networking opportunities for those member schools and so any school can be involved we have institutions that are large institutions small institutions two-year institutions as well as community-based colleges 
Um, our first, um, and I'm sorry, let me go back. When I mentioned that we provide different programs, training, resources, and support, um, we offer many different ways that many colleges can connect. One event that we offer every year is the annual President's Luncheon. Um, this President's Luncheon invites all 54 colleges to the table. So it's 54 presidents from different colleges around the state. They all come to the table and um, it's opportunity for those campus administrators to all come together and talk about different topics that pertain to a healthier campus. Um, this year we have um, Melissa Soko from, she's um, a Kent State of Wellness Director from Kent State University. She'll be presenting a holistic approach to a campus culture of well-being. And she'll be talking about pretty much how to focus on um, the community as well as the college campus and how substance misuse, how mental health and everything that plays a role into a holistic um, campus can be beneficial to the students. Um, this annual meeting provides opportunity for, you know, campus administrators to all come together and talk about things that will be beneficial to them. They will be able to talk about things that can help their campus and uh, also how wellness and prevention all can play together. And typically um, with these meetings, we have anyone from um, presidents uh, who are invited to their administrative uh, leads as well as many of those OCI representatives as well. Uh, we have also offers the Sockpaw meetings and which with these the Sockpaw meetings is a small Ohio College Prevention Association. It's a smaller component of the larger OCI unit and so many of the smaller colleges felt as though their needs were not being met and their voices were not being heard and so Sockpaw was a branch off of um, the larger um, national uh, annual meeting that we have with OCI and so we meet biannually in the fall and in the spring. We met this past fall and we had about um, 10 to 12 colleges that come together, they came to the table, small colleges, to talk about different things that were happening at their college and things that were important to them. I know Otterbein is a, um, also a very active member of OCI and the Sockpaw meetings. Um, push for prevention. This is a stipend that we offer um, and it's coordinated by OCI as well as Ohio Center for Coalition Excellence at Prevention Action Alliance. Um, it's made possible through uh, Ohio Moss, and we did it this year. Uh, we provide it, just like every year, uh, we provide opportunities for community coalitions and college campuses to implement environmental strategies. So people submit different topics and different things they want to use and implement on their college campus um, in regards to substance misuse. And so they, they present those, um, those uh, opportunities to us and we come back to the table and decide which campus and coalition we would decide to uh, award those grants. And it's intended to foster innovative approaches and increase the number of quality, the number and quality of environmental strategies used among co uh, coalitions and campuses. I kind of went through that fast, so I was talking fast, and I'm sorry, but I know other people have to get up here and speak. But um, my email address right, is right there at the bottom and our website. Um, with OCI, I am able, I am the go-to person for many college campuses. Many college campuses email me when they need resources, when they need um, someone to link uh, them to a certain uh, initiative or a certain topic, they'll email me. Um, and so I am the go-to person for them in regards to Ohio College Initiative and the efforts. They can call me or email me when they need uh, resources, when they need, if they want to have a meeting, <coughs> with other college campuses, they can call me and we can set it up. Um, we host the annual meeting, I mean, I'm sorry, the annual meeting, the president's lunches as well as the Sockpaw meeting, but we also provide webinar opportunities and other resources for those college campuses. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm the managing director of the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery. So it's a, um, a big, long name. 
uh, and we have a big mission. And so our goal uh, is to help support campuses across the country, not just uh, locally here in Ohio, in their efforts uh, to uh, reduce substance misuse among their students and support students who uh, are in need of recovery supports. And so uh, we're going to talk through some of the resources and tools that are available to you uh, through the Higher Education Center. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that many of the things that we're going to talk about are actually available to you at no cost because of our partnership with Prevention Action Alliance. So you heard from Daisha, and uh, we have a really great partnership working with them. Daisha actually has a split role with us where she serves uh, part of her time as a prevention specialist for the Higher Education Center, uh, and then another part of her time with Prevention Action Alliance. And we're really appreciative of, uh, of the work that PAA does uh, in support of campuses across the state. So some of you uh, may be familiar with the Higher Education Center. Uh, it was federally funded through the US Department of Education for about 20 years before it was closed in 2012 due to the sequester. Uh, and uh, at the time, the director, uh, Dr. John Clapp, was coming to Ohio State uh, to assume the role of Associate Dean of Research in the College of Social Work. And through uh, a partnership with the College of Social Work, the College of Pharmacy, and the Office of Student Life, as well as through the generous funding of the Conrad Hilton Foundation, we were actually able to reestablish the center at Ohio State uh, in 2014. And so uh, we've been here now for, it's been almost four years that we've been uh, on campus and working with uh, campuses in Ohio as well as around the country. And so I'm going to focus today on just some resources and tools that are available to you. I have a handout, so I'm going to pass that around. Um, our handout has uh, links of how you can actually access the resources that we're talking about today. So uh, one of the things that we have available is uh, our free e-newsletter that goes out weekly called the U Report. So it's just a compilation of current news, resources, um, and training opportunities that are available to you as a professional working in this space. Uh, it's open to anyone, um, and uh, there's a link on that page of how you can access that uh, email blast if you're not already uh, utilizing it. Uh, one the other nice things about the U Report is we actually have a graduate student in our office that uh, collects current research in the space uh, and digests that into easy to read briefs, uh, letting you know what the key takeaway is and how you can apply that to your work. And so uh, we have three or four of those articles every week in our U Report. So if you're not already checking that out, I encourage you to do so. One of the other things that we're really excited about uh, that is in its third iteration with the Higher Education Center is what we call learning collaboratives. Our learning collaboratives are a series of web-based trainings around a specific topic uh, that are presented live initially, recorded and archived on a member portal that campuses can access at any time. Uh, now these learning collaboratives typically have a fee, but through our partnership with Prevention Action Alliance, uh, they're being provided to all Ohio campuses at no cost. So we have done one specific to uh, marijuana Marijuana, one to collegiate recovery, and we're currently in uh, a prescription drug focused learning collaborative, so very timely for our event today. Uh, and uh, you haven't missed much. We've only had our first webinar, so we have our second one coming up next Thursday. And as I mentioned, that is uh, free to anyone on your campus who is interested in taking part in that. And all we need is uh, to get your name and an email address, and we'll set you up uh, with the information on how to access those webinars, uh, as well as how to access the member portal so that you can see the requirements recordings if you can't join us, uh, join us live. And there's a link on your page on how to do that. Uh, so I just want to highlight the webinar that's coming up on Thursday. It's with Dr. Ken Hale, who's an associate director with the Higher Education Center. He's a faculty member in the College of Pharmacy uh, at Ohio State and is the co-director of Generation Rx, which we'll touch on in a moment. And he's going to focus on the collegians' medication experience. So what is it like for a college student on campus uh, as they're trying to navigate um, the issues around prescription drug misuse and how we can educate them on safe medication-taking practices? So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Hale is the co-director of Generation Rx, and the College of Pharmacy is one of our partners here at the Higher Education Center. And Generation Rx is a wonderful resource for, uh, for anyone uh, because they have lots of turnkey uh, presentations that are ready to go, that are free, that are downloadable, that you can pick up and implement with a variety of populations. Uh, they have just uh, 
just updated the Generation RX University resources. So there are four new tools uh, that come with an activity. Uh, there's some supplemental videos as well as visual aids that are all available on their website at generationrx.org for free that you can go in and download and use uh, on your campus. And so we're really excited about uh, to partnering with Generation RX and helping them push those resources forward. They have one that is specific to uh, safe medication taking practices. They have one that's specific to opiates as well as uh, to stimulants because we know prescription stimulants are the uh, most commonly misused prescription medication among college students. And then they recently launched in collaboration uh, with a uh, with Zeta Tau Alpha's national office, a new resource that's a compilation of all of those resources put into one that's ideal for large group settings because uh, we know that uh, students engaged in fraternity and sorority life are at higher risk of experiencing negative consequences because of substance misuse. Uh, and oftentimes when we educate them, they're in big groups. And so our small group uh, activities that we've designed uh, to be very interactive with Generation RX are challenging to implement. And so we worked with uh, Zeta Tau Alpha Alpha and their harm reduction initiative uh, task force to be able to uh, pull out some of the key pieces that are most important for those uh, Greek students. But I want to mention that that, uh, that resource is actually ideal for any student, not specifically just targeted at Greeks. One of the things that we are uh, really proud about and really excited about at the Higher Education Center is our Screen You program. Screen You uh, is a web-based screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment program uh, that students can take on their phones or their tablets or any web-enabled device. It's brief, it's anonymous. Uh, they move through a brief screening, receive feedback based on their risk level uh, of experiencing consequences because of their substance misuse, move through a brief intervention if appropriate, and then are connected with strategies to reduce their risk as well as resources that are specific to your campus and community that can help support behavioral change. Uh, and uh, Screen You uh, is what the one resource that's on your page that actually does come with a fee associated with it. Um, and uh, we roll that into a membership that gives you uh, access to a, some additional resources through the Higher Education Center as well. Uh, it provides real-time reporting to campuses on a dashboard, uh, and it gives you unlimited access uh, to the the program to allow students to, to engage with experts. So the whole purpose of why we developed Screen You was to be able to move uh, the idea of expert beyond a clinical setting, which is typically done one-on-one -on -one, uh, with someone to make it more accessible for campus students to understand their risk level uh, and to be connected with resources. Amy. Sure, so uh, we have three programs, Screen You Alcohol, Marijuana, and RX, and uh, it's $2,500 for a one-year um, subscription to all three and then that comes with some additional benefits as well if anyone's interested in learning more about our, our membership and what that looks like i did bring some additional information and i'm happy to talk through that with you uh, but you do have our website on there uh, where you can take a look in uh, at you can get a demo we can provide you with some sample screens if this is something that that you're interested in we were really excited because screen you was uh, called out and highlighted in the president's commission on combating drug addiction and the opioid crisis uh, as a strategy for addressing this issue so that was really exciting for us us. Is there any, you know, if we were interested in Screen You but just didn't have the budget for it, is, is there any aid available for us or is that something we would maybe apply for in a grant to go to, to get? Right, so we don't have any aid through the Higher Education Center, but we have worked with a number of campuses that have done just that. They've written it as part of a grant um, and have been able to provide it to their campus in that way, and I'm happy to talk more with you, Jill, about uh, about how they've done that. Uh, we have, we're in almost 50 campuses across the country right now, so uh, we're really excited about the growth, and we think it, it can be uh, a great asset to campuses, particularly those of you that maybe don't have a person who is dedicated to this work, and, and that's the challenge challenge uh, that, that the center, when it was established, uh, really wanted to help focus on is how can we help campuses uh, knowing the limitations and resources that they have. Uh, very small budgets uh, oftentimes are uh, people who have are doing this work and have other roles. I know Jill, uh, we worked closely in the last couple of years, and so I know that this is not the only hat that she wears. Uh, and so that's true of many of the people who are doing this work on campuses, and perhaps that's true of some of uh, the rest of you as well. Yeah. Can you walk me through an example of, you know, if somebody takes, you know, if somebody uses the service and they, you know, do the quick run through the expert, you know, through screen view, what happens? You yeah. know, what happens if they're flagged? Sure. So, uh, 
much like in-person expert, it really relies on a student to take the initiative to make the next step. And so what, what happens is based on a student's risk level, they receive resources uh, that, will, uh, that will benefit them that are local to your campus and community. And so for a student who may uh, screen at a high risk level, uh, the resources are really focused on getting them into a meeting with a mental health professional, uh, whether that's uh, someone in your counseling center or health services or even a community agency that can help support them. And so that's what it really focuses on is uh, the importance of meeting with a mental health professional. But then it is on the student to be able to, to make that next step. Uh, through the program, we try to make that as easy as possible by providing, uh, campuses would then provide their contact information, a phone number, an email, what the best way to reach out to that uh, unit would be. And then students have access to that on their phones with just a click, they would be able to, to reach out to that service. And then I think I want to close on uh, sharing a little bit about our annual conference uh, that's coming up. We took a one-year hiatus, but we're really excited to be back in October. The national meeting uh, happens here in Columbus uh, at the Blackwell uh, Inn and Conference Center at, on Ohio State's campus. And it's really an opportunity to meet with campus professionals across the country uh, who are working in this same space, addressing prevention, intervention, and collegiate recovery. And we're really focused this year on uh, implementation science. So you see our theme is implementing change in urgent times. So we think that's a gap uh, that we can help uh, fill. Oftentimes we say, well, these are evidence-based strategies. Go on and do. Uh, but there's not enough people that say, well, how do I do these evidence-based strategies to make sure that I'm implementing them with fidelity uh, and that they're going to work the way we think they're going to work. And so we see the center as uh, developing some tools and resources over the next few years uh, to help with that and help fill that void. And we're starting at the national meeting. Uh, the call for proposals is open right now as a uh, Jose and Amy alluded to, we know that many of you are doing great things on your campus and we'd love to see those highlighted at the conference. And so you can uh, learn more about the conference or call for proposals uh, at uh, the website that's up here, go.osu.edu slash NATLMTG18. I believe that's on your page as well. And so then just connect with us. Uh, we're on social media, uh, catch us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, here's our contact information. So if you have any questions, I'll be here. I brought some additional information about our membership, Screen You, the national meeting as well. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, if there's any now. Great, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Ahmed Hosni, and I am the program manager for our collegiate recovery community at Ohio State, and I am also the director of recovery at the Higher Education Center, so I get to work closely with Cindy and Daisha as well. And um, I appreciate all the kind words about our program. Um, I think it is one that is um, very easy to, to cheer for and to get behind because um, it's a program that is best represented by the quality of the students that make it, make it, which are the reason why it exists. And so we have a bunch of wonderful students who um, identify as being people in recovery. And I myself am a person in long-term recovery and um, was a student at a collegiate recovery community, which is why I think I'm so passionate about these programs. And so actually, I'm from that small village in Northeast Ohio and started my college career at Kent State as well. And um, because of drugs and alcohol, I wasn't able to be successful there. And I ended up having to go 1,500 miles from my home to find college supports at Texas Tech University. And so the idea of coming back to Ohio to help support, to help develop a program that can support students in recovery and hopefully um, ensure that a program like this is on every campus in the country um, was a great opportunity because um, one of the things that we know and that we see is that college campuses understand that the importance in prevention is is paramount right we want to stop students from reaching that place where they are at risk but um, oftentimes I think we view the continuum of services for alcohol and other drugs as linear and I don't I don't I don't know that that's right because I think that the students who have resources given to them and begin their recovery start back off at a place where they need help to prevent the relapse to prevent going back to substance misuse and for me this is a prevention issue as well because the students who are at most risk at the most risk for an accidental overdose are the students who have a history of substance 
misuse, right? It's those people who have an opiate use disorder and are in early recovery and are in that fragile state where if they don't receive the services they need to maintain their recovery and they go back to use, oftentimes those are the stories we read about and we hear about on the news. And so um, I, I think that these two things go hand in hand. And so when we talk about collegiate recovery programs, um, they are supportive environments on college campuses that allow students to do two, the two most important things at this stage of their life. Continue their recovery, right? Reinforce that healthy decision to stop drinking and using drugs and to begin approaching life holistically and I that taking that holistic approach to wellness all aspects of their life and also to continue their college education and not have it interrupted because it's you know more and more important these days to receive a formal education in order to have a successful life and so we hope to be able to support them while they're on campus which is a scary place if you're in recovery and so um Collegiate recovery programs, and these definitions are provided by the Association of Recovery and Higher Education, that they need to be institutionally sanctioned in order to call themselves a collegiate recovery program. And so they just need to be identified and, um, and I guess the university needs to accept that they are a part of the university and then um, they're consistent with the recovery management system of care right and this idea that 28 days and then good luck you know I hope you do well isn't enough when we're talking about supporting people with substance use disorders right and so when you think about an individual who's 18 19 20 21 years old who has a substance use disorder and they leave treatment and now they're supposed to go back to a college campus the likelihood of them continuing the positive changes they made in treatment while they're in an environment where all of their peers are drinking and misusing substances because it's a part of the culture is very unlikely and so having these services to help them continue receive you know engaging with and receiving services through a year two years three years four years however long it takes to graduate is paramount for students in order to be successful and so um because we have limited time one of the slides that i wasn't able to put up is um there's evidence that shows within the first year there's a 50 percent chance of relapse but after five years that chance reduces to 15 percent Right. And so when I think about how long it takes to get a college degree, if we're supporting students and providing them these services, then, you know, we're eating up two, three, four years of that five years. It takes them to get to a place where they can be confident that their recovery is going to maintain and it's going to be um, something that, you know, is a strength and a and just a uh, cornerstone of their lives. And so currently what we know is that there's over 175 collegiate recovery programs across the country. And so when I say this, again, the definition is loose. It isn't, um, not all of the programs are gonna have the resources that a school like Texas Tech University, Rutgers has a really wonderful state-of-the-art program. Um, we are often viewed as a, as a really strong and powerful program because five years ago we didn't exist and today we, we, you know, we are supporting students holistically and so oftentimes Schools are, are um, eager to learn how we were able to do it in such a short amount of time. But I think the important part to note is that you can support students with little resources. All you have to do is have a passion to help people better their lives and to move forward and to continue and to progress. And that's how we started with a graduate assistant who had 20 hours a week to devote to, these, to this program and, and a half of an office that she shared with another student. And so there are multiple conferences dedicated to collegiate recovery programs, including the national meeting, so you don't have to go far to, to attend one. Research is funded and published. There's recognition from federal agencies. Um, we've seen system-wide expansion in many states, New York, New Jersey, Texas. And so there are lots of different systems that are seeing the opportunity to support students in recovery and there are lots of foundations and nonprofits devoted to helping encourage these programs to grow and so these programs do lots of things and i think i think i i've just been sitting and um and listening to this and um you know what i wanted to say and what i'm going to say has changed a little bit because i just keep thinking about the stories of the students that i meet every day right and so um 
you know, I, I, I just helped a kid get placed into treatment who it was his first semester. He just started at Ohio State in the spring, and he's a student who's been in and out of treatment for some years. And he moved to Ohio and to Ohio State to be a Buckeye. And, um, you know, within the first two weeks of him being there, he being in Ohio, he relapses, you know, because he didn't get connected with a supportive community. And... Um, you know, within three weeks of his first semester at Ohio State, he was withdrawing and going back to long-term intensive treatment. You know, and I just think that um, the reason I bring this up is not because he's a uh, he's necessarily a success story. I think the that chapter needs still needs to be written, right? But you know, working with his parents is the thing that I think is the most. Um, is what I took away from this. And this is a family who has put, since this kid's 23 years old, who has put so much time, energy, resources, and love into him for the last five, six years. And, um, and they just don't quit fighting. You know, and that they're fight, and and for them, it's not a fight for their to see their son walk across the stage. It's a fight to see him live to thirty. You know, and I think that that's the story that um that I hear and see the most, and I see that. You know, there are so many families who who did what they were supposed to and saved money for their kid to go to college, and um, they ended up paying for him to go to treatment instead. You know, and so how am I, as a professional at Ohio State, helping remove barriers for him to get access? To that that's why I get up in the morning. You know, is for the kids like like him and the students who, um, if if properly supported, and again, it doesn't take much to do that, and if given the opportunity, they're going to thrive and flourish. And so. Um, our program is one that started in March 2013. We've had over 65 official members. That, that number goes up every day. Um, we've had about 250 current and prospective students serviced. So we don't just serve the students who are official members of our program, but we also serve students who are not sure whether or not they want to initiate their recovery, right? And so another statistic is that um, of all the developmental areas and developmental stages of the lifespan, that 18 to 25-year-old stage, the one that we think about most when we talk about college students is the one that is most likely to develop a substance use disorder. And so that's the fastest growing age range for substance use disorders across the country. But it's also the least likely to ask for help and to seek treatment. You know, and so a lot of the work we do is when people realize that there's high risk behavior going on, they refer them to us. And sometimes it's just talking to them and inviting them to come to a meeting. But hopefully we plant a seed that resonates and that one day they decide, you know, maybe there is something better there for me. You know, Know, and so a lot of the work we do, we don't get to see, reap the benefits right away, but we hope some, sometime down the line that, you know, the energy that we put into meeting with these students is something that, you know, hopefully saves their life again, because this is life and death. And so um, we have a mix of undergrads, graduate and professional students. We have, um, you know, doctoral candidates. We have seen students graduate from medical, medical, um, the College of University, the College of Dentistry. And so we're talking about students who are very, um, I don't know, they're very talented and they're very smart individuals. And so, you know, just helping them get from what do I do now to, you know, I, I know where my life is headed is, um, is pretty meaningful work. And so this is, this is what we do. And so this, the, this is a representation of what the collegiate recovery program is. And so we're lucky enough to have two dedicated staff members. And so again, that, the, the funding for that started with the um, generosity of the Conrad Hilton Foundation. And so with, with our partnership from the Higher Education Center, it made it possible for us to expand our program to where we have two individuals who work to support students in recovery. We have a dedicated space, which is in-kind donation from the university, um, which is nice. We have recovery scholarships, and we offer all different kinds of support. We even have a sober living environment um, for students on, on campus. And so all of these things are great. And all of these things were, um, you know, are things that we're, that we have the benefit of because we, we work at a university that has the resources to give us those. But, you know, being a person in recovery, one of the things that I learned is the only way we keep what we have is if we give it away. And so our, our attitude towards people in recovery has always been that not all students are going to want to go to Ohio State or are going to be accepted to Ohio State, but they all have a place in our community. And so we have students who are from 
all different Franklin County universities who consider themselves members of our program. The only services we're not able to give them is we haven't worked it out for them to live in our dorm yet. We're hoping to get there, you know, because we think it's a vital, it's a vital resource for students. And we are, we haven't been able to award them scholarships just because the endowment is written for Ohio State students and it's a bunch of stuff that I don't really understand. And so I just, I just don't ask too many questions when it comes to that. But as far as providing them professional and leadership development on, on our campus recovery meetings and all of the peer to peer support and the sense of community that they need in order to thrive and flourish, any student is able to, um, to come and join us because, um, you know, it's just important that they find a, uh, they find a peer group. I think one of the, uh, and I'll end on this, one of the most important things um, for a young person to, able to, to be able to achieve lasting recovery is that they have a positive social and personal identity. And oftentimes they find that from finding peers who are like-minded and who support who they want to be. Right, and so giving college students who decide that they want to be in recovery a community, a ready-made community, you know, a just add water community of people in recovery who are their age and who um, understand that it is life and death for them to just have that one drink at the party. You know, that giving them that might be the, you know, the difference between a long, successful, happy, purpose-filled life and, you know, a continuation of what they've been experiencing for how many years. And so, um, again, uh, we, you know, a student can start in our program. And another thing that, you know, that I liked what Cindy said and uh, one of the reasons I love the Higher Education Center is that, you know, I am I'm an Ohioan. I, I love my state and I love um, the fact that, you know, so. There are so many schools who are starting to support students in recovery. They're popping up every day throughout our state. And um, anything that we can do to support you guys and to even start talking about how do we start, you know, maybe we never get to the dorm, we never get to the scholarships, we never get to two dedicated staff members. But I think being intentional with what resources we do have, we can begin somewhere. And any support is better than no support. And so we'd love to, to help you with that in any way possible. And so, um, I don't know if, yeah, go ahead. How does a student find out about you? Like, if I, you know, if I'm having trouble, if I'm in active use, you know, how, how do they, and I'm on campus, how do they know you're there? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's actually, we have such a large campus that, um, you know, we do our best to get the word out that we exist on our campus. And um, every four years we have a, a new 50,000 person audience, you know, is the way that we see it. And so um, we, we do the best that we can. Um, we promote, we do large scale events. We have, we have sober tailgates for football games and we try to promote them widely. Um, we connect with resources on campus like CCS, and the logical touch points of the counseling center, right? The places where you think a student in recovery might end up. And, but most importantly, it's word of mouth because a lot of times students find their way to a 12 step meeting before they find their way to us. And so it's important that our students who are, know that about our program are talking to the other students when they meet them in recovery meetings. And so, I mean, that's still one of the, that's still one of the, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that we have to work on every day is keeping in the front of people's minds so that when they meet the student in need, they know, hey, I remember that resource and I should connect them to it. I have another question. Yep. If, if these good folks don't get to a point where they have a technical collegiate recovery community, but they want to do something for their students, um, you know, like let's say they have kids on campus that fall into a bad way, start drinking a lot, you know, having trouble with school. What what types of other activities or other efforts would you suggest that they can do short of in the collegiate recovery community? I think the first, I think one of the first things that you can do is help start or facilitate some type of support meeting on your campus. And so um, you know, we I think our minds go to AA or Narcotics Anonymous in a 12-step meeting first, but even if we have a staff member who can dedicate an hour or two of their time, who's un, who, um, I don't know, maybe has a history of working in this area or as a counselor to start some type of group 
that's just an hour a week for students to come together and find each other. Because again, I, the, the, I, you know, I think I'm pretty good. Well, this is being recorded. I think I do a great job and I deserve a raise. But the person who is the person who is keeping those students you know, in recovery is their peers. It's not me. My most important job is to, to put them together so that they can support one another. And so it's just finding a place to give them an arena to support one another. And so I think that that's the logical place to start is all you need is a person who has an hour or two a week and a room and then to put some flyers up and hopefully the students come together and support each other. Jose? I had a question for you. So you're a college, university or school that's here or that will be part of our meetings in the future if we, as we get together, needed help. How can you help them? I, I mean, I think first of all, we, you know, always are willing to lend our experience. Um, and we are, and again, it's, you know, for me, I don't, I don't care that anybody graduates from Ohio State. I just hope that they get, have better lives and they graduate from somewhere. And so, you know, helping to start programs, technical assistance, phone calls, um, strategizing, working with them, connecting them. You know, there are lots of different models for collegiate recovery. And, you know, again, lucky enough to be at Ohio State University, we've become you know, leaders in this field. And so connecting them with universities who can provide them the technical assistance to develop a program that would fit better on their campus. Because our model isn't for everybody. And it shouldn't be, it's not the best model, it's just a model, you know, and you should, you should build what your students need. I think that's the most important thing. Definitely open some oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. We'd love to. And I just want to give a shout out too. I'm from Otterby and we have such a small population connected and I I don't know if any of the students who have come to me have actually reached out but we've had a few students who came back to campus after being um, in a inpatient program and we don't have the resources even if we had the money we don't have the volume of people yeah. of students in that same situation so um, he's been so gracious and saying hey your student can become a part of our community and I know He's even offered, you live in Westerville, right? I do live in okay. Westerville, yeah. So even offered to, you know, connect with those students. I don't know if they've ever reached out, but, you know, I'm going to keep, I keep that contact information because I know they're there. So if anyone else is in a small university, here's a great opportunity. I appreciate that. Did I hear you say that some of your students in your program they're, they're in reluctant recovery. Is, is that the term you use? That they I, I they want to be there, but they term. don't want to be there? Yeah, I think that's an appropriate term, and I think it's just a part of their developmental stage, you know, and that being 19 years old and, and making a decision that seems like a decision for the rest of your life, there's always reluctance, and it's sometimes it's our job to push them off the fence, you know, and um, that's what we try to do. Yeah. Can you repeat that, uh, that stat, 50% chance of relapse the first year of recovery, yeah. and then it goes down to 15 percent after the, after five years. After five over years, receive, yeah, five years, and so it's the the key is to to give them support. And I think, you know, the, the most, and the thing about that stat is that it is a chore to find support for your loved one who's in recovery for even a year, let alone five years. But when these services are built into the cost of tuition, all they have to do is enroll and they have all these services free of charge, you know. And so I think that that's where college, you know, this is a social justice issue and we can help that by u utilizing our resources to provide free services to students. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I am uh, Chad Kettler, and I'm with Community Properties of Ohio. And unlike everybody else who's spoken with such great passion, I need notes. So I've got my notes up here. Um, let me just move my slide here. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about, so first of all, I want to thank Jose and Amy for the opportunity to come together and be a part of this discussion um, and to reconnect with them. It's been great uh, many years. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about CPO and a specific initiative. Uh, CPO is an affiliate of Ohio Capital Corporation, and they're our parent company, and their, their mission is to preserve, construct, um, and build affordable housing. 
And CPO was formed, uh, we're coming up on our 15 year anniversary. So uh, 15 years ago, we took on a portfolio, largely driving force from Ohio, or Ohio, um, OSU, the OSU um, and campus partners because of the close proximity to the campus, uh, Wyland Park had a large number of these affordable housing units. And so we took on the portfolio in 2003 and did a, a pretty massive um, uh, renovation to the tune of about $133 million um, to make this quality affordable housing because it really was at that point in 2003 the housing of last resort. So we're serving about 3,000 families in about seven um, very urban neighborhoods here in Columbus. Um, and, but what the connection to, uh, to this meeting for us um, that Amy made the connection was our Scholar House initiative. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that because CPO really does view affordable housing as a platform that many of our residents are able to use to have a future story and have future opportunities. And so the passion and commitment that you all have to support to the students, we have the same thing going on here on a very uh, wide, wide range of, of issues. But the Columbus Scholar House project, um, and I'm just going to show some pictures here. This is it. Um, it is uh, four buildings there you'll see, and it's literally a block away. And so we are extremely close to Columbus State, um, OSU, Franklin University, CCAD, as well as you know many other colleges that are, are feasible for the students living here. This concept um, was seen probably about six, seven years ago now um, down in Kentucky. Kentucky has about eight of these uh, scholar house programs. And so myself and our founding president, um, Isabel Toth, had taken a bus tour down there with many people from the city and uh, our key partners to look at the program. And we said, we need this. We need this here in Ohio. And so in 2012, we piloted the very first building up there in the left-hand corner, if you're looking at it, the yellowy brick one. That uh, was a pilot program and has 10 units of housing, two and three bedroom uh, units in that building. And um, we tested that program out and uh, widely successful. And so we were able to secure funding and support in co-development with CMHA to build phase two. And we were able to build an additional 28 units. So now we have 38 student parents. Um, those families, here, and these are actually students, Lakeisha and Courtney and their children. Um, <clears throat> the Columbus Scholar House concept is really for student parents that have at least one year left of school. They have to maintain a 2.5 GPA or higher uh, throughout their involvement. And then at, after graduation, they have up to six months before they have to secure other housing uh, so that a new student parent can come in. Uh, and we work very close. We have a formal MOU with Columbus State and OSU to do our scholastic interviews because there's also an essay um, that folks have to write in order to be admitted into the housing and um, as well as meet other housing requirements. So there, there are just a few of those, and they can live there based on their income. And so they don't have to worry about the pressures of paying market rate rent um, throughout their stay with us so that they can focus solely on their families and their education. Uh, this is a wonderful program. Um, I will tell you that all of our graduates have been successful. We have had zero um, negative interactions with people not being successful in this housing. Now it is a very small portion of what we do. As I said, we have 3,000 units, but not all of those are Columbus Scholar House. They're not education focused. Um, so I would just say that um, with our partnership with OSU, uh, the Access Collaborative, um, Tracy Lewis has been a phenomenal partner for us helping um, our residents in the academic, you know, any academic support that they need, as well as our own resident services here um, that we offer to our families to do financial and social support, family coaching with these folks to help them be successful. Uh, one of the components of the Kentucky model was child care. There's a child care component, right? Well, when we did the first 10 units, I talked about the pilot back in 2012, we were not able to incorporate the child care at that time. It was always a vision. And we actually had had visions of um, working with Columbus State's child care center, which I understand is now um, not, not available. But the um, 
child care need was clearly still an issue. And there's a really interesting story that I'll, I'll share quickly. Um, beside that yellow building, the first 10 units, there was a duplex and it was abandoned and vacant. And so we acquired that. And we had a vision of renovating that, making the top floor of that um, housing for the child care provider. We, we went through getting zoning and everything to make it a child care type B home. I learned more about child care than I ever thought I would need to know in my life. And uh, we had visions of making that uh, a child care home where the provider would live which was also going to be a graduate of the uh, program, uh, would provide the child care to the families and the lower portion of it. As we got in, it really became financially unrealistic for us to do. It was upwards of 800 and some thousand dollars to renovate it and make it what it is. So we had to come up with plan B and um, our partner, uh, Steve Gladman with the Affordable Housing Trust, he owned the building that the 10 units are in and his commercial space, his office was down on the first floor. And one day there was a conversation and said, hey, you know, Steve, wouldn't it be great if you, your offices were somewhere else and we could just use this commercial space for childcare? The next day, the man called and said, stop by and have a conversation. I think this is doable. And within 120 days, he had moved out, we converted, did the renovation, and made that a child care center partnered and operated by the YMCA for quality affordable child care. The cool part is, the duplex that we were originally thinking about was only going to serve about 24 kids. This child care facility serves 96 babies ages 0 to 5. It's so cool. So these are some interior photos of that and some of the kids. Um, <clears throat> I will say that through partnership with the YMCA, they have been a great partner with us operating this. It serves the families of Col uh, Columbus Scholar House as well as other CPO families that need child care um, for other reasons. So. What do we do with the duplex? We built a playground. So we went after and secured funding and through our own reserves as well, took that land and redeveloped it to make it a, um, a playground for the children of the Columbus Scholar House um, project as well as the Early Learning Center um, because we know that that's critical to the development of children um, and our residents don't often have those resources readily accessible to them. Uh, so this is the playground. And as I said, when you leave today, if you drive by, if you go down 17th towards Long, you'll see this project. It's along 17th and um, on the corner of Long. The playground is east of, it's on Long Street. Um, it's east of the initial 10-unit uh, building. So with that, I will um, just say that, you know, this really couldn't have been done without our key partners and the folks that were involved in this deal. As I said, we co-developed this, this with CMHA, but the Ohio Housing Finance Agency, the Ohio State University, Columbus State, um, the Y, Affordable Housing Trust, and obviously our parent company, Ohio Capital Corporation, um, has been uh, instrumental. We would not be able to do what we would do without the folks listed up here on this screen. Um, and it's really in support of helping people have future stories and really using housing as a platform to make that possible. So um, I'll lift, leave you with my contact information and like many of you did, I will plug, please follow us on Instagram. My marketing folks will love that. Um, so if you get the opportunity, CPO Impact is um, our Instagram and you can see all the work that we do. This is just a small portion of the things that um, CPO is involved in uh, throughout Columbus. So. Yes, Amy. How do you see Scholar House heading in the future? Wow, that's a great, so um, <laughs> that's a great question, Amy. And um, I honestly, so this is my first year in the role with, I, while well, I've been with CPO uh, for its entirety, um, almost 16 years, uh, this is my first year in the role of um, president and CEO of the organization. And so I am in the process of doing some future planning um, uh, of what, our future looks like and I will tell you that you know if there are ever opportunities for this type of a demonstration program to be expanded whether it be in the Wyland Park area or other areas of town um, I would love to to explore that option that's not necessarily on the books right now but I will tell you it's a it's a thought in the forefront of my mind I'm assuming all 38 of your units are occupied yes 100% is there a wait list there well there is not technically a wait list we um, because we don't take housing applications because of the um, scholastic interview process before, we really partner with Columbus State and OSU, our contacts there to, as we know a student's going to be graduating, 
they then funnel, they, they go through their list. So I'm not really sure what their list looks like. We don't maintain a housing list for it because of the upfront uh, processes really comes through the schools. So, but we've not had a problem filling um, any of the units, quite honestly. Yeah. How long after a student graduates do they have before they're asked to transition from the program? Um, six months. So um, six months from graduation. There is also in the program, you may have a question about what happens if somebody's not meeting the requirements during their time with us. There, it's just like any university, there is a probationary period, but it's only a one period, um, one time um, situation. You can't be on probation for multiple semesters or school cycles. Chad, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, Staying sober is a real challenge. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how so you support your residents to make sure that that if they if they have a relapse or or how, how do you support them or, or how can you connect them with resources? So that's a that is a wonderful question. While we aren't necessarily experiencing that type of issue in these thirty eight units, broadly across our portfolio, that is um, an issue that we face and so we we have a resident services program the building that you're in the other half of this and if anybody wants to see it afterwards Regina Clemens who is here Regina raise your hand uh, she is the director of resident services she heads up all of the different programs and core services our at-risk resident program um, our AmeriCorps we employ 16 residents that go out and um, read to our children getting them ready for school um, so and then we have family coaches Jose and so to, to circle back to your question, um, when issues are identified um, in our portfolio, whether it be at Columbus Scholar House or others, we have family coaches, we have caseworkers, case managers on staff that actively engage immediately with those residents to help stabilize their housing and help them develop their plan for how they're going to be successful. And then we link with quality key partners that do that work in the community. Um, so that, that's probably the best. Yes. Yeah, that people don't get kicked out of their houses. Cor so. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's why we developed what you know I mentioned it uh, the at risk resident program. We are at the core a property management company, right? And so, oftentimes, people think of property management companies as somebody who's just you know it's you don't pay your rent, you got to go. Well, people have to be accountable for their housing. But we understand the folks that we are housing have limited financial and social resources that. Many of us in this room don't, couldn't even fathom the choices and decisions they may need to make in order to just get through their daily lives. And so we developed an at-risk resident program. So some things obviously are non-negotiable, but if somebody is at risk for losing their housing, whether it's because of housekeeping type things, failure to be able to pay rent, their utilities got turned off or shut off or taken out of their name, um, you know, many other reasons, we immediately our managers, our property managers, link them with our services department, and then they actively engage. Should the, should the resident choose to engage, we can help stabilize that housing and get them back on a course. That, you know, we have success stories, and obviously we have stories that are not successful, uh, but that is the nature of what we do. What about pregnant students? You know, maybe she's not due until, you know, nine months from now, but um, would she, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, we have not had that situation. <laughs> um, and I, without having our handbook handy, I'm not sure how we handle, I mean, I'm assuming, uh, bec you know, we can't ask questions because of HIPAA laws and all of that. So I'm not sure um, how we would handle that situation, but we certainly would take it, you know, under advisement and consider them for, for housing potentially, yes. I mean, they're gonna be a parent. I've, I, I, I've actually gotten to tour the scholar program before, but and then I, one of the things that I, well, I really um, was impressed by is that it's not just the parent, the mother, but if they are in a relationship with the father, that the, the entire family can live there as well. Correct. It is not so. We the majority of um, our residents right now are single females, but we do have one married couple, phenomenal couple. I love them to death. Um, but yeah, and it can be male or female, or it can be a married couple. There's not a uh, stipulation on that. It just so happens that the majority of our folks are single moms, uh, but there's not a there's not a requirement that that's the case. All right. Well, thank you. Follow us on Instagram. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, that, but I heard about I heard a couple of action items, and I just wanted to verify what we have, and if you have any to add on, let us know. Uh, number one, it seemed like many of you were interested in some type of training. 
Um, you know, so to verify who that training would be for would be great. You know, many of you mentioned that it would be for your staff, um, you know, on how to recognize signs and symptoms of substance use disorder and just how you can recognize that in your students. Um, so, you know, we'll definitely be talking with the folks at AdamH about that and just really making sure that, you know, anything that we can run through that would be beneficial to you that we give that information your way. Um, the second thing that I heard, you know, from many of you is your interest in Screen U. And Cindy, I, I'd love to follow up with you on that and make sure that all of you have that information. Um, you know, please let us know if you're interested, regardless of whether or not you have that funding, because, you know, we have this, I make no promises, but, you know, if we have the interest in our colleges and universities in Franklin County in something like Screen U, we need to get in front of our partners to say, this is something you want and you do and you or you do not have the avenues to get it so let let me know if this is something that you'd like to do and we'll try our best to help you get there um, you know I wanted to again hit the point home that opiates is our paramount focus here today and it's our focus on the action plan but we know that it's not the only drug that's a that's a problem we know that alcohol and marijuana and other drugs are at issue I don't want to shy away from that so if we could work with the collegiate recovery community and others on just learning from you and your events that you have going on in the community so we can share with other colleges, you know, maybe we can keep just spreading the other alcohol and substance use free options for students so they can enjoy time in the university and communities and not feel that pressure. We'd love to just keep giving your examples that you have out there and just keep spreading that good word. And then my last and final example is, you know, I used to work at the state and I know that there are other colleges throughout Ohio that really have a good focus on something to do with substance use or addiction. For example, University of Dayton, um, you know, is really focusing on um, prevention. You know, there are other um, colleges and universities, uh, University of Ashland, that's really focusing on, you know, just some new, um, you know, medicines and tools, you know, to help on the treatment side. You know, we can make this as big as you want it to include groups. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to create another OCI or another higher education group. So we want to steer people in the right direction for things that are already existing. But if we can be a resource to help just coordinate every all of you and make sure that everybody is getting good information, we're glad to do that. We can meet in person if it makes sense. You know, we could, you know, not do this so it's taxing, you know, but we can make sure that we keep in touch. Um, you know, we can also make sure that we have regular emails. You know, I need to hear that from you. So that'll be something that we'll ask for for feedback once you get that email from me. So any last minute thoughts? Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.